There's the line that I was talking about. The Darkling should have done something, I said. He should have protected you. He has, Alina, more than you know. Besides, he's as much a slave to the whims of the king as the rest of us, at least for now. I mean, if I was Grisha, I'd totally be on his side. That's all I'm saying. It won't be a party or a picnic for Alina, but... Time for them to make a demonstration and they get hot and heavy. <laughs> Now, I know all is, it's everything is going to happen so quickly. They're going to do the demonstration, then almost bang it out. <laughs> and then, <laughs> of course, before we got the chance to flirt and dance with the dark side a little, Bagra is going to be like, I haven't told you this for seven months, but he's my son and a bit of a bitch, so you need to leave. And I'm just like, why couldn't she have gotten with him for once? Why couldn't she have just flirted with the dark side? <laughs> It wouldn't have done her any harm, I'm sure. I am so in the gutter today, but the point stands. <laughs> the point definitely stands. Bagra could have just waited another night. Dramatic, dramatic guy <laughs> just keeps coming out of the shadows and saying her name. She jumps every time he shows up. <laughs> As usual, he wore a black kefta, though this one was made of raw silk and velvet. Sue me, but I need to see Ben Barnes in every, every single one of these outfits. If you're getting pretty actors, then please, please make them pretty all the way. Yes, time for their, time for their demonstration. I'm so, oh, that's gonna be lovely. I love it when they work together. I love it. Because when he touches her skin, she just erupts into light. It's a wonderful, wonderful image. <clears throat> Give me a minute. I will read it out to you. <clears throat> when the Darkling turned to me, he was smiling, his eyes alive with excitement. Whatever news he'd received had been good. Let's give the, let's give the people what they want. I'm sorry, but... Loki's quote from Dark World came into my head and imagining Loki's voice with the Darkling is just dangerous for me. I shouldn't go there. With little preamble, he slammed his hands together and thunder boomed through the room as a wave of darkness fell over the party. He waited, letting the, the crowd's anticipation grow. As I said, a drama boy. The Darkling might not have liked the Grisha performing, but he certainly knew how to put on a show. Only when the room was practically vibrating with sensation did he lean into me and whisper so softly that only I could hear. Now. A bright column of light shot upwards from my palm, gleaming in the darkness of the ballroom. And how the mirrors make it pretty. I want to see all of that. I want to see all of that. I am realizing I don't want a single scene cut out. That is very rude of me because they will cut out a lot. But I don't want them to cut out anything. I think it's all lovely and could be very visually stunning. I closed my palm and the beam disappeared. Then in a flash I let the light bloom around me and the darkling. Wrapping us in a glowing sphere that surrounded us like a flowing golden halo. He looked at me and held out his hands, sending black ribbons of darkness climbing through the sphere, twisting and turning. I grew the light wider and brighter, feeling the pleasure of the power move through me, letting it play through my fingertips as he sent inky tendrils of darkness shooting through the light, making them dance. The crowd applauded, then the darkling murmured softly, Now, show them. She slammed her hands together and a loud rumble shook the ballroom and white light explodes. This entire scene is gorgeous. The Darkling pulled me to the side of the stage and whispered, Do you hear them? See them dancing and embracing? They know, they know now that the rumors are true that everything is about to change. But aren't we giving these people false hope? I asked. No, Alina. I told you that you were my answer, and you are. I mean, I'm sorry, but I know he's yanking her chain, 
But he genuinely seems so amused all the time at how clueless she is. And I mean, frankly, Dark Souls, me too. I would too be amused at how clueless she is, but that'll change. We all know the conversation in Ruin and Rising that... The Darkling's mouth quirked in the suggestion of a grin, but his eyes were serious. Did you really think I was done with you? <laughs> the mental images just write themselves. I'm sorry. This part of YA just... <clears throat> so sounds like fanfiction. A little tremor quaked through me. You and me both. Then abruptly, he took me by the arm and pulled me from the stage into the crowd. Oh, I love this so much. People offered their congratulations, reached their hands out to touch us. But he cast a rippling pool of darkness that snaked through the crowd and vanished as soon as we had passed. It was almost like being invisible. I could hear snatches of conversation as we slipped between groups of people. I love that so much, and I don't... I'm not sure why he doesn't use it more often because he can literally make them invisible. I know she learns that too by manipulating the light. And that's why he creeps her out all the time because he literally makes himself visible. But I think there's so much potential there that she doesn't really use. I don't think after this he really ever uses the fact that he can make himself invisible and travel through the shadows. And I think she should have. I really think she should have made that more vital later. Because it's a very important power for him to be able to just move unseen. Potential loss there, but still, still beautiful, and I can't wait to see it. After a while, I went ahead and ate, but now it's the almost sex scene, which is always so awkward for me to read because it's so out of everything else that it's strange. But the iconic, beautiful quote, the problem with wanting is that it makes us weak. I'm still imagining what it's like because if she feels like she feels when he touches her hand, how does she feel when he kisses her? Like, that must be insanely powerful. I don't even want to imagine what would happen if it was more. I don't know what might have happened next. <laughs> Why were they interrupted? The girl just heard one wild night with the wild side and I will repeat that until the day that I die. Mm. The Darkling shoved his shoulder against the door so that it wouldn't open. Nice. And now Bagra is just going to ruin everything. <laughs> can I come to you tonight? Yes, you can, sir. And she agrees. Alina just let loose for one night. You could have had probably the most explosive night of your life, but no. No, she needs to run away into the forest. <laughs> that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Right, she's gonna meet Mal now. And then we get to Bagra, and she leaves. All of my hopes for a <laughs> villain relationship squashed. That's life. My girl Alina just freaking out. It seems the Darkling was right after all, he said with a smile. Pardon? I squeaked. Be less obvious, sweetie. Be less obvious. I understand Mal, I have no idea ever how to pronounce it. Mal has to go through his own development. But the jealousy, I mean, if I saw the Darkling. I'd be jealous too, but he isn't jealous in that way, unfortunately. Just admit it, he owns you. He owns us all, I think. Alina's definitely the one who's right. And when she says, I like how he looks at me, who wouldn't, sweetie? You tell him. But in all honesty, like, they've been apart for a long time now over half a year and he hadn't gotten any of her letters he was probably 
just as upset as she was that she didn't write back. So I do understand his point of view. He comes, he didn't hear from her for seven months. Then he finally comes here and sees her very cozy <laughs> with the creepy leader. I mean, I'd be kind of pissed off too, so I do get it. I just feel bad. But also, Alina, like... I don't know, I just, I see both sides. I get how she would be pissed off that he is being hypocritical. I get it. But I definitely see his side too. Even friendship-wise, to think that she didn't even write to him and then she, he sees her literally in the highest rank possible would kind of seem like he's beneath her now. So I get it. I see both points. I I sometimes don't see both points, but here it's definitely clear they're both in the wrong. I'm confused by Bagra right now, honestly. She's like, I thought you didn't believe in Morozova's tag. That's what I told him. I hoped that he might give up the stag's pursuit if he thought it was nothing but a peasant tale. Uh, uh, he's called Alexander Morozova. I'm pretty sure he never believed it was just a fairy tale. I know she's just telling that to Alina, but at the same time she's about to tell her that he's ancient and her son, so why the lies? I find it unrealistic that after a thousand years, she hoped that her son, the last Morozova would think they're literal and not even ancestors but that his grandfather was fictional I just find it a bit weird it's a bit of a pathetic excuse Bagra I don't think he would have ever thought that was fictional definitely not Yeah, it took you eight months to let her know that the Darkly is ancient, <laughs> but fine. I still think she should have warned her sooner, but yeah, then we wouldn't have exactly a book because she needed the training. I like people to be trained before I tell them they're in mortal danger from my son. That might be my biggest issue with this. This is why I dislike the first book the most. It feels a bit juvenile and the most important important bits it feels a bit juvenile it gets so much better i love siege and storm and ruin and rising and the plot gets more complex i mean this book is almost written as naive as as naively as alina is which i get but it's still a bit weird <laughs> still a bit weird like bagra is even a little bit pathetic dare i say it in this book It took you about a thousand years to reach the conclusion, Alina. This woman had to literally let inky darkness into the air so you would connect the dots. Searching her features, she saw the explanation clearly. The ghost of what must have once been a beautiful woman, a beautiful woman who gave birth to a beautiful son. You're his mother, I whispered numbly. Seriously, are you kidding me? He has served countless kings, faked countless deaths, bided his time waiting for you. Once he takes control of the fold, no one will be able to stand against him. I do like that a lot, though. He is ancient. He's had plenty of time to master lying to a lo lonely, naive girl. <laughs> I mean, a little rude, but true, Bagra, you tell her.
If Ravka is made whole, the second army will no, no longer be vital to its survival. The Darkling will be nothing but another servant of the king. She shouldn't have said that because when she <laughs> lays it out like that, I'm actually again on his side. <clears throat> Unfortunate. He will lay waste to the world and he will never have to kneel to another king again. When she lays it out like that, I am absolutely on his side and I'm pretty sure that's not what Lee intended. <laughs> and the way the Darkling lays it out and wants his side again. He will go about it very much the wrong way, but I can't. I can't not agree with him. <laughs> and the story of the Starless Saint, I actually read that one and... <laughs> I don't know, I'm just so conflicted. I absolutely know he's wrong in the end, but I agree with him so hard. We're reading about a magical world and where magic is dying, because that's always the problem. How am I not supposed to be on his side? I'm supposed to side with the king and Nikolai, really. <laughs> I mean, if that's who I'm supposed to side with, then in the words of Daenerys Sargarian, burn them all. I believe this is where it's most obvious. Um, sorry, let me just the playlist that I was listening. What happened? <laughs> Copyrights a thing. So, I believe that this is where you can tell the first book is weakest because it's the reveal is so abrupt. It's like. She needed the training, but here's now a reveal all of a sudden, and let's just go. Now, full speed ahead. It's been 200 pages. It's strangely paced. So strangely paced. I remember loving books 2 and 3 because of how they were paced. It was lovely, beautiful. Every beat was in place. This one is just very weird, and you can tell that it was the first one. You can really tell it was the first one. Because this is where it gets weird. Now she's going to meet up with Maul. And aside from the fact that they're going to travel around. When they get to Morozova Stag. And they go to the skiff. It's over. It's it's very, very strange. It's like it's slow because she needs to train. But then all of a sudden it's quick. I I don't know. I'm I'm not loving it anymore. The beginning is incredible. But this is just so weirdly put together now. Very, very sudden. It takes her like five minutes to believe Bagra and shift completely from trusting the dark language. Okay, sure. But I don't know, it's just, it's weird. I feel like in, in two pages she expects me to completely shift my focus. And that's a bit clunky in my own personal opinion. I know people think the first one is the strongest, but it is very much not. Love anything though, it's this. All those years ago, she said softly, before he'd ever dreamed of a second army, before he gave up his name and became the Darkling, he was just a brilliant, talented boy. I gave him his ambition. I gave him his pride. When the time came, I should have been the one to stop him. She smiled then, a small smile of such aching sadness that it was hard to look at. You think I don't love my son, she said, but I do. It is because I love him that I will not let him put himself beyond redemption. And then how <laughs> how Alina tells her that the Darkling might come to her room and Bagra was just like, foolish girl. <laughs> I mean, fair. Fair enough. I know the story comes in book three. Like, the background story. <laughs> I don't know. It's just so strangely presented to me. So strangely because... Even how Bagra says it, I am completely Team Darkling, but then how he goes about it is a bit off-putting, to say the least. So it's very strange. It's very strange. Usually I'm very clear on whether I agree with the villain or not. Here, I agree with him, but then I sort of don't anymore. It's very weird. I'm getting very tired, which is why I'm not commenting that much anymore, but I kind of like... How the story is actually more like Maul isn't the childhood friend that like is in love with her and she notices it. It's the other way around. 
And it's an interesting dynamic to explore now they're in the forest and they talk and everything. And I'm, I'm kind of vibing with it because it's like she was the one who was always in love with him and he didn't notice. And only when she left, he noticed that he missed her and that the attention that he got from her was actually a bit different to friendship. Like, he liked her too, but now when they're talking, it's literally, like, he uh, he realizes that he misses her presence. And it's strange, you know, but it's not, it's usually when you have the villain, the best friend, and the hot guy, it's always the same kind of trope. But here, the villain is a bit more complex. The hot guy is a total idiot who's not even an option when you think he will be an option but he's not thank the lord and the guy that you know all along that she will actually be with is the best friend that didn't realize the main character was in love with i don't know i'm kind of liking the dynamic i am making a lot of people angry with this video and i know that but frankly i don't care <laughs> i don't i'm loving them sorry i'm loving them get the fact that Elena will definitely earn the power of the stag because she spared him, which I love. I absolutely love. It's gorgeous. But when the Darkling angles the cut away from her because he would never kill her, or can't kill her, it's so cool for some reason. So cool. <laughs> but he's so pissed off afterwards. And I get why she spared the stag, but frankly, considering how dangerous it is, if the Darkling gets the stag, which he will, Alina should have just turned around immediately and killed him. And that's me saying it. She should have. She should have just jumped to the stag. I mean, she's already next to the stag. She should have just killed him with the knife this instant. He was already hurt. He was wounded. And if she allowed the Darkling to do it like she did, she was screwed. So, and she definitely would have been able to overpower him if she had been the one to kill the stag. I'm just seeing <laughs> the problems with this the closer we get to the ending. As I said, first book is by far the weakest. I am complaining now. This is probably the worst trope and I hate it. I hate it with all of my heart. But when you find out that the villain was bullshitting, all of a sudden they're so villainous, it's almost comical. Like as soon as she finds out that he was lying to her, he's grinning maliciously and doing the... <laughs> doing the jealous villain speech. Like, he's behaving like a comic book villain now as soon as she found out that he was lying. And I hate that so much. It happens every time. It happened with Maven, too, and Red Queen. Like, as soon as you find out they're bullshitting, all of a sudden they're making evil speeches and evil glances and evil smirks. It's, it would be so much creepier if he just behaved the same way as he had. I'm sorry, but my point stands, just like from the last clip here he's all of a sudden he's creepy and threatening i think it would be so much more realistic if he behaved the same way because like david understands the future said the darkling the edge of a threat in his voice it sounds like he's threatening them to follow him which isn't true i think a lot of them follow him actually from loyalty because they know what he wants to do for the grisha and it will give him such a more such a realistic feel if he actually behaved how he always behaves because now all of a sudden because she found out that he's the quote-unquote villain he's behaving terribly all of a sudden even though people have been following him for a thousand years for a reason the Grisha respect him and love him in their own way so I don't get it I'm angry I'm sorry, I just have so many problems with this, with how he was handled in the first book. It's so wrong in a way, because considering he's behaving comic booky, it's weird. It's so weirdly paced and constructed. You can tell the first one is by far the weakest of the three, because, like, he is angry when she flinches, but, like... He didn't even try to talk to her and tell her, I mean, he does later, but he came all villain smirky and, like, bitching about Maul. 
he just, it's weird. If I was the Darkling, I would come up to her all casual and be like, so what, my mother tells you one bad thing and you immediately want to run away? I thought we actually developed some sort of trust. Or, you know, I would try to play it differently, not just show up completely villainously guns a-blazing. Like, he's really doing his best that she not see his side. Like, if I'd spend months and months trying to get her to trust me, I would definitely play to that, not immediately try and torture her boyfriend. If anything, I'd cozy up to them. <laughs> like, I want to make the world a better place for us. You two could live in peace, and you could have your powers. i try something, not just immediately behave like, I don't... Weird. It's so weird. <laughs> it's probably my least favorite villain trope. I will love them later and their dynamic, but this is just so, so weird. I feel uncomfortable <laughs> because it's such a shift. I feel like in three or four chapters, we went from a normal book to something so rushed and barely, barely stitched together that it resembles a plot. As someone who's writing now properly, I'm nearly done with my first book. This is not good. I would never say that I dislike the Grisha trilogy because I love it, and I know I love books, books two and three. But this is the third time that I'm reading this first one, and it's not going well. Past page 200 is just going downhill, and I am hating it. I am hating it so much. The fact that I don't like it. I hate it. <laughs> Considering the Darkling's my favorite character, I don't like what was made with him. What was done with him. I don't like how Alina was handled. And I think that her and Maul could have definitely benefited from a bit more of a slow burn. Just to wrap up my point, this feels like a standalone. It literally feels like a standalone. I And the Darkling could have died in the end and it would have been a standalone. <laughs> it would have been a bit of a rushed one, but it could have been just one book that's how this feels like she's rushing to finish it because there are no more books left it's strange it's almost like she didn't know if she would make more books than this one i mean she had to have known because she planned the thing with the amplifiers but it really feels like she wasn't sure if she'd go on yeah all in all i'm not loving it this will probably come back to bite me but now that she's talking to Ivan, isn't it kind of pathetic to have a villain that's like, once he's, once he's tasted that kind of power, you will all be in chains. The birth of the Darkling and his ideas was to make a better world for the Grisha. Like, I get that along the way it probably became more about him than about the others. But when we saw him interacting with the others and how he treated them and how he helped him and how he treated them as equals and came to their battlefields without Morozova's stag. Like, before he even knew that was an option, and that it was real and it could be found, it just... I don't know, it feels a bit wrong to say that he would immediately clap them all into chains? Because essentially, in the core of his idea, he is right, just like Ivan says. A lot of people die in service of a weak and pathetic king, and they deserve to have more power in a world where their power won't be appreciated anymore. So it's a bit weird that she is... I don't know, that she, the Lee made the point so black and white. Like, why do you think he would immediately turn to world domination, if you get what I mean. The point is, now that my cat is done with the litter box, <laughs> I think it would be a whole lot more powerful to see someone who wants to do a good thing slowly lose their way because of the power, not you in book one <laughs> telling me if he does this, he will go even more insane and he will chain all, all of you. Like... It's, it would be so much more satisfying not to just say that in book one, but to actually see it. Personal opinion, but so far he's right. So far he's completely right, even though he's beha behaving comically, completely comically. But now after she's talked to Ivan, 
she should realize that he's right, not just immediately jump. If I knew the Darkling, if I had sort of gotten to know him in the last five months, I would actually want to walk up to him and talk to him and be like, why do you want th just me alina's <laughs> apparently not that interested i'd want to walk up to him and be like what do you actually hope to do what do you hope to accomplish do you really want everyone in the world to listen to you how realistic do you think that is will you kill everyone if they resist you like what is your end goal and can i think he'd actually react better to her asking him than her just being like you're evil, he chained up my boyfriend, and I'm not at all interested in what you have to say. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I think that the protagonist should be a whole lot more interested in what the villains actually want to do. Because if, at his core, his idea is absolutely correct, instead of teaming up with the king and Nikolai and those idiots in book two, I would actually want to figure out why... This man, with a good idea, with a good idea, is going the wrong way. That'd be my priority, not siding with the rapist king and his stupid sons. <laughs> I'm getting a little angry now thinking about it because I'm wishing for that book, but... <sighs> Again, just personal preferences, but... I definitely want to talk to him and be like... Be like Okay, your idea and your goal is sound, but I want to know how you actually want to do it. And if you think it's very effective to do it in a way that will alienate even those people you want to protect from you. Like, what, what's the plan there? I would definitely want to find that out. But no, <laughs> no, they're going to have a very funny conversation about, so you're with Maul now, huh? You think he can understand you like I can understand you? And I think his strategy is so incredibly stupid and I blame Lee for that because you have an intelligent villain who shouldn't be prone to like, oh my god, she doesn't look at me the same anymore and suddenly be pissed off. He shouldn't be like that after a thousand years. You basically have a little petulant child who's being annoying. <laughs> Right now, I dislike him a lot, right now, even though he's literally my favorite character later on, because he's not even trying to explain himself and get back into her good graces. He, like, immediately marched in, like, his villain flag just flapping in the wind, <laughs> and he was just lock up her boyfriend, torture her, like, he's just not even trying to get her on his side. And he has a good argument, too. He can be like, I'm trying to make the world better for Grisha. You're a Grisha now. Like, you should want to help us. Like, even make a speech. Like, I don't want to spread the Shadowfold. I'm just going to do it for our enemies. Anything. He's not even selling her anything. He's doing his best work to make sure that she hates him right now. And I... I dislike that. Like, it's such a bad move. He's not supposed to be an emotional child like them. You should be able to feel the weight of his years. You do later, but you definitely don't in book one. You don't. And you can't argue to me that he's emotional because he fell in love with her. He saw her like three times. Maybe four. During the months that she was in the capital. There's no way he's in love with her at this point. So. I call bullshit. In my opinion, this is literally her biggest flaw. She made it. I know I made the, the opposite argument before, but in the first book at least, later it's a bit more complex, she made it about the romance. The first chance he gets to talk to her, he's like, just what kind of life do you think you could have with him, Alina? That's the first thing you want to say to her? Really? The guy you know she's been pining for all this time? And just because you nearly banged it out once doesn't mean that she's in love with you either. You're hot. But that's a far cry from actually being in love with you. I feel like he's just went from a thousand-year-old wise guy <laughs> to a weird 17 or 18-year-old kid who's bitter because his crush didn't find him hot enough. 
I'm just getting a weird vibe. Why is the first thing that he tells her... What kind of life do you think you could have had with him? He can never hope to understand your power. There's no ordinary life for people like you and me. And how he clenches his fist when she asks where Maul is. Like, he knew at the very least that they've been friends all their lives. Like, I don't know. He's just behaving so childishly and I hate it. I hate it. I feel like she forgot what she established for him. Like, he was either pretending or he wasn't. I'm gonna draw the parallel here. Bear with me, this is a long video anyway. I'm gonna draw the parallel here with Maven from Red Queen because he's my everything. <laughs> and it's a very similar trope. But there, at least, it was very clear and established why he was the way he was. And how where the line was between pretending and not pretending and most importantly he was actually a what 16 year old kid this bitch is literally a thousand years old so the same rules don't apply he has no reason to be behaving like a child absolutely none so yes i am bitter I am very upset because, <laughs> maybe because I've consumed a lot since then and I'm older. But I read the Grisha trilogy right after I read Red Queen and I was like, mm, the Darkling was so much better handled than the way Victoria handled Maven. And I disagree. <laughs> I disagree because there's a whole millennium of experience that the Darkling should have. And he doesn't have the excuse of being an actual 16 year old boy. So I can't wait for books two and three where they get actual character development and maturity, but this is just not it. This is not it. I might have to knock down some stars of this book and that hurts me personally. It does. I still can't wait for the Genya storyline. I will wrap this up and then read that, but I am upset. Again. Now Ivan's just smirking every time she passes by him. So what, everyone turns into a villain around the Darkling now that he was revealed to be the villain. And how when he finally gets her into the tent and you're like, we finally get the chance to talk like adults. He's literally just sitting, not even trying to say anything. He keeps threatening Maul, which you're doing great, apparently, honey, Alexander, you're doing great. This is just so pathetic. So pathetic. I've given you power beyond all dreaming and you can't wait to run off and keep house for your tracker. I am exhausted. I loved 80% of this book, and now I just feel like I'm watching a Marvel movie. <laughs> I had to. I had to say that. That's never what I intended, Alina. He ran a hand over his jaw, his expression fatigued, frustrated, human. But how much of it was real and how much was pretense? Couldn't take chances, he said. Not with the power of the stag, stag not with Raka's future hanging in the balance. I'm trying to imagine him running a hand over his jaw, frustrated. How the... <laughs> it's a weird gesture, but sure. Why is he being so emotional? Later he's gonna be like, yeah, I have no more tears left to spill. But now he's just like, so annoyed. She says, you've been lying to me since I met you, which is true. And his hand tightens around the glass. Like, sweet Jesus, why are you more temperamental than women once a month? Like, seriously. Did you deserve my trust? He asked. And for once, his voice was less than steady and cold. Bagra whispers a few accusations in your ears and off you go. Did you ever stop to think of what it would mean for me, for all of Ravka, if you just disappeared? 
didn't give me much choice. Of course you had a choice. And you chose to turn your back on your country and everything that you are. That isn't fair. Fairness, he laughed. Still she talks of fairness. What does fairness have to do with any of this? The people curse my name and pray for you, but you're the one who was ready to abandon them. I'm the one who will give them power over their enemies. I'm the one who will free them from the tyranny of the king. And give them your tyranny in return. Someone has to lead, Alina. Someone has to end this. Believe me, I wish there was another way. I'm sorry, but the point he's making is still good. <laughs> no matter how much I hate this conversation, I despise it. But he's still right. He is still right, but she is against him because she thinks he will go a certain way when he accomplishes this. Knowing the backstory, I support him 100%. I mean, besides what Bagra has said, which she has her flaws too. I mean, sorry, honey, you were the fabricator of all of this. But he, so far, has given her, except for the villain of stairs in the forest, which again, very, very comic-y. He has so far, because I'm basing this on the fact that she knows him. She actually, not that well, but she knows him. They've been together for like six months. Ish. But still, she does know him know him enough that they actually kissed she has no real reason to believe that he doesn't have an actual cause she doesn't know him enough to know 100 percent that what he wants to do is dominate all of humanity and that is exactly my point <laughs> literally my point because she says he sounds so sincere so reasonable Less a creature of a relentless ambition than a man who believed he was doing the right thing for his people. And then he's literally like, he slumped back in his chair. Fine, he said with a weary shrug, make me your villain. Where is Lena getting the facts that she is getting? Here, he has literally gave her not one single reason why she should believe he will slaughter them all as soon as they get into the fold. And that makes me so, so pissed off. She's making a villain where there isn't a villain yet. So far, all he is doing is making a good point. <laughs> like, yes, he put the collar on her, which I definitely understand. It was a bitch move, and it was written very, very clumsily. But now we're back to the normal conversation, and that's what happened in Red Queen as well. I'm sorry for doing this. I feel like I'm so rambling. But every time you make a villain like that, and they finally get to talk to the main character, the main character is immediately like, you lied to me. You lied to me, and that means you want to kill everyone in the world. I don't want to hear a word of explanation. Really? Someone you knew lied to you, and then is making a valid point, and you don't want to know more? I cannot understand that. I can't understand that. She doesn't even give a damn. She's just like, okay, this is black and white. I'm done. You just want to kill everyone. I feel the same anger that I felt when I was reading Red Queen. The exact same anger. That's why I feared to reread this, because I knew it had the potential to be something I will be angry at. The more I read, the more I'm pissed off. One minute she's making him into someone actually ancient and the next minute he's just a pathetic, pathetic child. Just petty, so petty and so weak. Alexander, my honey, you know I love you with all my heart, but what the hell is wrong with you here? You may say your goodbyes and like, ugh. Murder a monster, all of those things. I hate you. You'll tire of hate soon enough. You'll tire of everything. Now all of a sudden, behind his eyes, I saw the same bleak and yawning chasm I had seen in Bagra's ancient gaze. I do love the quote, though. Fight, fight me as long as you're able, you will find... You will find I have far more practice with eternity. I love that a lot. A lot. I love it. 
like the quotes are good, but the emotion is so confusing. It's so confusing. I feel like within seconds, he, he switches from someone who is so easily triggered by her liking her childhood friend that he's like, no, no, she's not alike, allowed to like anyone but me. Then he suddenly switches to someone who's like, you will find a hat farmer practice with eternity. You will tire of everything in a few seconds, S centuries or whatever the hell. I'm so confused. I'm so confused. So confused and conflicted. I can't wait to read the rest, but now I'm actually a little bit scared of what I will think of them because I'm pissed off. I'm very pissed off at this. I'm almost done. Thank the Lord. But this is, the more I read, the more I think this is written like a standalone. And hear me out. Because now she's saying goodbye to Maul and they're like, I'm going to die. And they're having the speech like, I love you no matter what you did and that stuff. All of this book feels so much like it's over. And the last fight will feel like that too. It's going to be like, we finally defeated him. They're even going to think he's dead. Like, I hope the Volcra tore him apart. You're going to feel like it's dead and they're going to run away. She could have stopped there. Why does this book feel like... I, I remember, though. Even the first time when I loved this so much, I felt like it was weirdly paced. It felt like it could have just ended there. I felt a little bit like that even after book two because we know what happens at the end of book two. But books two and three are almost like a separate series almost this book is just so strangely separate from everything else and it's just so simple you essentially have three characters that you care about you don't even know the others again yeah but you don't even know the others yet later you actually have a cast a complex plot actual motivation it's so weird it's like she sold this one book didn't know if they'd let her write more and then wrapped it up quickly and then when she got got like the permission she wrote books two and three and they were great it's just so confusing I have no idea how she managed to snag a trilogy but also make the first book feel like a very lazy standalone very very weird I am so confused at this point and I am 100% sure that this could have possibly been a standalone. Obviously, I'll never know, but that's my opinion, and the closer to the ending I am, the more sure of that I am. All that aside, the scene where he, like, claps his hands and his darkness connects with the fold and it breathes like it responds to him, that is so epic, visually. That I think if they animate that, or I mean CGI it, or whatever the word is, I think it has the potential to look epic. Like, really good. It's seriously, just reading about it looks so cool. <laughs> so, so cool. Yeah, I'm so sorry, I'm just reading it. I'm trying to see if there's anything interesting to comment on. <laughs> now hear me out. I'm absolutely not justifying, in this case, the slaughter of an innocent village. But, but... Considering all we know about the Fierda and Shuhan, Kirch and everything... And how they treat their Grisha. Please remember that. I am very much forced to agree with his method. He demonstrated with just a little bit of a stretch what his power can do now. After a thousand years, he finally managed to do something and put fear into them and get rid of the king's influence. He's literally like, he looked them over and said very calmly, Peace on my terms, or your precious mountains and your saints forsaken tundra will simply cease to exist. The darkling would not hesitate, he would not grieve, his darkness would consume the world and he would never waver. 
But that's not what he said. That's so not what he said. He didn't say I will kill you all. He literally demonstrated what he could do. Told them you're not in those words, but you're literally terrible to my people. Terrible. You sell them as slaves and burn them as witches. So he turned and said, tell the story of what you've seen today. Tell everyone that the days of fear and uncertainty are over. The days of endless fighting are over. Tell them that you saw a new age begin. A cheer went up from, a, from the crowd. I would cheer. I'm sorry, but I would cheer. In this world, in this specific world, if I was a Grisha, I would cheer. I would. Considering how they're treated, I would cheer too. Because he didn't say, okay, get ready. Like, get ready, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. He literally said, this is what I can do. I'm sorry, but... Like, I agree with him 95%. I'm not sure if he could have displayed this without killing the people, which I'm not a fan of. But he is 95% right. The method could have been adjusted, but he is right. I'm sorry, he is right. This is not even our world, so I can't compare it to anything, but here, with all the facts, he is right. He is. He just is. He's right. I'm sorry. It's not black and white. It's truly not black and white. And that's why I am absolutely on his side. If anything, I would have loved to see a man who was right with the right idea go insane because he can't have lived that long and then be given this much power without losing his mind. I do believe in that. You can't have infinite power and just be normal. But that would have been an interesting arc. Not just being like, even though he's completely in the right here, not just be like, okay, but he's evil. We need to kill him. And that's it. She had such potential to explore something fascinating. But no, the next scene is just him being like, let's kill Maul because... Because reasons. I have absolutely no reason to do this right now. And I'm not a 16-year-old little bitch who's just bitter that she wouldn't sleep with me. That is just the stupidest part. The stupidest. Now that I've read it again, I am livid. She is on a thin line between brilliant potential and just a teen romance. Here we are again. I'm nearly done talking. Don't worry. But how she just... D I love innate power to a certain extent. I really do. But how she... It's one thing to have a lot of power. It's another thing to use it in a way that she doesn't know how. She does the cut without learning to. And later she will, with almost all of the amplifiers, she's going to have to learn how to do the cut properly and cut the mountain and all under Bagra's tutelage. And here she just does the damn thing. Need I say more? We're Mary suing and we're at page 300. Seriously. And again, her with the preaching. Is that what you want? A world of darkness? A world remade in his image? Well, frankly, if his image is to stop, you know, oppressing us, I'm all for his image. Where someone actually said that to her. Like, sis, this truly isn't as black as white as you would think. Just because he's a angsty little bitch who threw her lover overboard, we can talk about that because even I have a problem with that. It's just stupid and pointless and very much out of character for someone who's ancient and wise and apparently so emotionless that he can't grieve anymore. But that aside, why did I forget that she is 
somehow even more ruthless than him in the ending. Why did I forget that? This bitch literally jumps off the ship and lets them all die or rather be devoured and she cuts the ship in half so they can't even move the ship. Her people, the rest of the Grisha, I'm pretty sure Genya is somewhere around here too. And the Darkling is the only one who won't actually die here because these are his creatures, they won't eat him. What is going on here? I am feeling so differently than last time I read this. For the first time ever, I'm actually pissed off at Alina. Sure, she like hated what she had to do. She's like the others on the skiff had failed to come to my aid, but they deserve to the to be abandoned to the Volcra. Uh, <laughs> um, they didn't come to your aid because unlike you, they're actually listening to the soundness of his idea. <laughs> they have doubts, as anyone would, after the demonstrations, but does that mean that they deserve to be eaten alive? I'm sorry, but <laughs> the more I read this... The more I think that Alina should have gone with him because at least then we would have had a story where the villain properly corrupted the good girl and they went on a journey together. But instead we have her at the end of book one becoming very much like him, maybe even worse because she doesn't have a goal in mind. She just runs away and hopes to never have to see Ravka again. When they run away, they definitely don't want to come back. And the Darkling actually had a very, very good point. I am so confused by this book. So confused. I'm done. Very much done. Considering this is literally one of my favorite series of all time, worlds of all time, a lot of things of all time. I did not expect to be this angry when I left it. <sighs> I am literally pissed off right now. So pissed off. I won't repeat everything I already said because this is already going to be like an hour long. To conclude, this book was written like a standalone and at the last minute continued on as a series. That's the only opinion I have. That's at least how it feels. I'm definitely not saying that she didn't want a trilogy from the start. She probably did. But this is how it feels. It feels like someone just lazily threw together a book with a wonderful world, great ideas, and excellent magic, and then all of a sudden decided, wait, let's make this a trilogy. And like, Lee, I love you. You know how to write and craft and create. But I truly have to bone, a bone to pick with you on this one. You hopped around with character development, you didn't quite know what to do with the Darkling, and you made your protagonist worse than him in the finale. I'm so confused. I'm not sure if I even want to rate this book on Goodreads, because so far I had rated it as 4.5. I think I'm gonna have to knock that down. Like, a lot. If I rate it, I'm going to have to knock it down a lot. Because it's not even close to a 4 anymore. Because of the first half was excellent. I'm, go I'm thinking about knocking it down to like a 2 or 2.5. And that hurts me. That honestly hurts me a little bit. I didn't expect this vlog to go like this. Because I was so excited at the beginning. And so happy that I was rereading this. It's just the last chunk, just like the last chunk from 200 and something to 300. So from realistically rating, the last part would be like a 1. The first part would be like a 5 because I enjoyed it so much in the Bhagavad training and the dialogue and the magic. I enjoyed it a lot. 
So if, if I even it out, it'd be like a three, but considering that I'm angry, I'll probably give it a lower three, like a 2.6 maybe, 2.7, 2.7 feels good. But that now hurts. An old favorite knocked down to a 2.7? I burned myself. I burned myself. I will now go read the Genya story. I will just give a couple comments about that. And then I will wrap up the vlog. My condolence is that you had to go on this journey with me because I rant. I rant a lot. Let's talk about the tailor for a minute. <laughs> I love Genya in case that wasn't clear. But how the Dark Maid literally kicked Soya out, which frankly, thank the Lord. But he goes to the Dark Land and he's emerging from the baths, pulling a clean shirt over his head. He really has something to look at, all lean muscle and pale skin beaded with moisture from the steam. He runs a hand through his damp hair and gestures me forward. How is she? I'm so sorry for that. I guess the playlist just ended. <laughs> It played the Attack on Titan opening. <laughs> we will ignore that for a minute. But now Genya is going to talk with the Darkling. And if you've never read the Taylor before, I might read some of it out to you because it's great. I love their dynamic actually a lot. I love how close the Darkling and Genya actually are. Because he helped her with the king. They def he definitely knows more about her than she told Alina. And I love that. I feel like he's talking more honestly to her than he is t with Alina. And considering the, the all that I said in this video, this feels more in character than the entirety of the ending. Because he's talking actually calmly and he's composed. And he's honest with her in a way that he never is with Alina. And I'm sorry, but the way that he loves his horse... Not me always falling for villains who are only kind to their horse because they hate people. <laughs> if you can tell, I relate. But he's just stroking his nose. Oh my god, that's so cute. And how they're actually honestly talking, he doesn't seem malicious at all. He just knows what he's doing. And Genya knows what he's doing. They're not talking or arguing and like, oh my god. I lean against the fence, my back to the paddock, fingers worrying the scrap of paper as the darkling murmurs softly to the horse, low words I can't make out. Not me, almost tearing up because he's so soft with the horse. I forgot about this story, oh my god. After what I just read, this is, oh my god. Do you care about her at all? There's the briefest pause. What are you really asking, Genya? I like her. When this is all over, you want to know if she'll forgive you. Maybe, I say. She won't. I suspect he's right. I certainly wouldn't. I just didn't think it would matter to me as much as it does. You decide, he says. I'll have the letters brought to you. You kept them. Post them. Give them back to her. Do whatever you think best. I watch him closely. This feels like some kind of trick. You can't mean that. He looks at me over his shoulder, his gray eyes cool, old bonds. He says as he gives his horse a final pat and pushes off from the fence. They can do nothing for Alina but tie her to a life long gone. She's suffering. Genya says that. He stops my fidgeting with the barest touch of his hand. His power flows through me, calming, the steady rush of a river. Best not to think where the current may take me. You've suffered too, he says. He, leaved, he leaves me standing by the paddock, the tracker's name folding and unfolding in my hands. Okay. 
Why am I on the verge of tears? Okay, I forgot, completely forgot what the story was about. And... Uh, <sighs> okay, yeah, that just... cemented the fact that I'm on his side. Because it's not all black and white. It's truly not all black and white. And his conversation and relationship with Genya proved that. This short story, like there's a little bit more with just Genya. But this short story and the trust that he placed in her. He's like, you've suffered too. You know what we've all suffered. You probably understand me more than anyone else. You decide what to do with the letters. It will only tie her down to a life that she can't have anymore. And you know what we have to do. Like, Kenya knew from the start what they planned to do. Not all the details, cl clearly. But she knew a lot of the plan. And he was really honest with her. And it hurts me. <laughs> it hurts me so much to see him like that. Because... That makes the ending of the book even more... I understand we are reading the book from Alina's point of view. But then you give me literally four pages of Genya's point of view and the story changes. The story changes drastically because you know what Genya has been through. It all depends on the point of view. And the fact that the story was only written from Alina's when you get a little glimpse of Genya's point of view... And then you get Alexander's point of view and the demon in the wood. And it all shifts. It all shifts instantly. Instantly you see the story differently. And unfortunately, because I read both the stories, I am completely bitter that Alina never sees the story from that perspective. <laughs> I suppose it's realistic to have someone who just refuses to see things other than black and white, but but damn, this hit me in a way I didn't expect it to. <laughs> it hit me in a way I didn't expect it to, and the way he cares about his horse just makes me want to cry. Because I love characters who are so numb by their destiny that they are only soft for animals. That's like a weakness of mine and didn't expect it to kill me after I just finished a book that I was angry at. Please read The Tailor. It's definitely worth it. I'm going to read the rest of it now. Okay, let's have the conversation really quickly though because I'm, I'm on the verge of tears. First of all, The Tailor is very hard to read. Probably the hardest thing to read in all her stories. Need a minute. But secondly, read the tailor by yourself. And then... Oh, I am pathetic. I am pathetic. I get so weak sometimes. When I consume a lot of stuff all at once. Anywho. This is not a stop fest on camera. Read the tailor. And then I dare you. To tell me that the darkling is a right. That's all. That's all I have to say before I start crying. I just dare you to read it. And... from someone else's perspective aside from Alina's and tell me that he isn't right before I start crying again because that's very fun we're gonna wrap this up and say definitely read the tailor <laughs> Read the tailor. And then when I go on to Siege and Storm, we will look at the story a little bit differently. And analyze where Alina actually 
went from a stupid person <laughs> to a person who understood and when Alexander actually shifted from someone who was right into someone who lost their way. Now I'm just emotional. And for what? Well, I know, I'm not sure when Lee wrote The Tailor. It feels very different from the book. So maybe she wrote it later, but... In a way, it's brilliant how she shows you that... Not to quote Obi-Wan, but that the story very much depends on your own point of view. It really depends on your own point of view. <laughs> so yes, I won't say anything else about the tailor. You go and read it. You go and read it and by yourself. It's probably very cheap on like Kindle or something. I have it at the end of a paperback. The different editions have the extra stories. I bought specifically these editions because they had the Genya story and the Demon in the Wood, which I previously bought as a Kindle. So read the tailor. Read the tailor and <sighs> this is it for this video. <laughs> we ended with a bang. I went from pissed to in literal tears. <laughs> So this was very confusing, both for me and you probably, an age long, and I hope it was still entertaining and that it provided you with enough information and feelings about the thing that's about to be adapted without having to read it potentially. So maybe that was useful to you in some way. And I have nothing else to say. I have ranted enough. I will see you in this Siege and Storm video, and that's it. See you next time.